Hello everyone, uh, this is the next installment to uh, the numerous videos I have. I hope you guys are enjoying them. Uh, i got all kinds of topics to cover and and uh, this one's going to be a little bit about uh, conditioning tips and breeding tips. In my opinion, the two go together, you know, the best... Uh, Dogmen, in my opinion, were the ones that bred their own dogs and competed with their own dogs. Uh, I'm speaking of the past. And uh, the reason for that is, one of the main reasons is you know your dogs. First, you're breeding the type of dogs you want. They're yours. You feed them, raise them. Do all that to adulthood. So you're very familiar with your dogs. You know how to condition them. You can even breed them to be influenced by the uh, by the traits of their ancestors as far as the types of conditioning you want to do with them. Uh, they will inherit those traits like good work ethic or prey drive or intelligence, how to adjust to certain things. You can raise them to... Do your keep from a very young age. And, uh, you know, that has a ton of benefits. It just makes the work easier for you. And it makes makes it uh, everything flow a lot easier. But when it comes to, to breeding dogs, you know, there's some questions that are often asked. You know, or some questions that a person person should think about you know you know are your family of dogs living up to the standards of their ancestors you know you have to be familiar with the standards of their ancestors you have to be familiar with the traits of their ancestors up close and far away too the influence on the current dogs are the dogs that are closer up but at some point those dogs themselves were influenced by the dogs that were closer to them. And it goes back like that for generations. So traits can carry for generations. The dog may have uh, an influence of a particular dog in its background. Uh, very little influence from that particular dog as far as, uh, you know, it's not related to that dog. In that sense, it's so far back and there's so many other dogs in between that point from the past and current. But the traits from that dog can be carried forward. And if the traits of that dog are shared by other dogs in your pedigree, then it just compounds those good traits. And it'll they'll be moving forward from different individuals. You know, are, are your dogs better? Have they evolved or become stagnant? Stagnant would mean, you know, when someone come, becomes kennel blind and their dogs don't improve. That may involve a better culling process. That may involve a better process of choice. It could involve adding outcrosses or loose line breeding certain dogs. Uh, you know, a friend of mine once made a statement, you got to live the dogs to know the dogs. And that's true because there's all kinds of things involved and you really have to know your dogs to be able to do that. So in terms of breeding, you know, what are your expectations? And the same with conditioning. So with conditioning, you know, there's a lot of prep work leading up to the actual conditioning process. I've spoken on it before. Dogs need to deworm, be dewormed. They may need an antibiotic. They may to, need to be defleeced and dipped or whatever. You have to have their area that where they're going to be held during conditioning. It may be the area that you have them in if it's secluded. It's best to have them secluded. It may be inside. If the dog's not familiar with being inside, you need to start that process 
from a young age is best, but at least two or three months before you begin your conditioning. So he's comfortable being inside. He may be, quote unquote, locked up for hours. You know, and if the dog is not comfortable with just relaxing inside, then you need to, to uh, take the steps to get him to be comfortable. And it could be just bringing him inside for a few minutes a day. And, uh, you know, he may not, sometimes they won't lay down in their crate or the area you have them in. A kennel if you have it inside. In a garage maybe, you know. He may run around or try to get out or jump up and down because he's not used to it. So you may have to do that repeatedly until he does get used to just being relaxed and uh, kicking back. A lot of dogs that are that are very active or uh, have a high prey drive, uh, it takes a while for them to settle down. But if you can get in their mind by doing this repetitive kind of Pavlov's dog theory of where they get, you put them in the spot, whether it's outside or inside, and they just relax and are not active, then uh, your keep will go a lot smoother, right? Because, you know, if they don't settle down, you're going to have to take that into account during your conditioning, which might mean you have to give them more days off because they're so active on the chain or in the kennel, in the garage or whatever. So, uh, you have, there's some dogs that are, that are just mellow, you know, they learn to go with the program. When it's time to work, they work. When it's time to rest, they rest. There's others, like I've mentioned before, Bolio dogs that are very active. Some of those dogs, you don't, some of them didn't even go through a keep because they weren't put up. They were just let on the chain. They're active all day long. All you're doing is monitoring their weight. The last week, you'd strip them of the fluids, and they're going to be at weight, which is real close to the weight they are on the chain anyways, or their chain weight, right? You can do that, which would be a very short keep or no keep. Or if you get accustomed, get them accustomed to being put up where they settle down, you're not going to have them outside on the chain for very long because they'll just run the chain or do hoop de doos in their kennel run. So those dogs you have to monitor more closely, which means they will be put up most of the time. You take them out to do their work, go through the process of the conditioning, of the exercise that day, whatever program it is, and then you put them up. If it's a type that's very active and you don't do a lot with them, a short keep is best, in my opinion. They don't need 8 weeks, 12 weeks. But if you want to do an 8 week keep on them or 12 week pre-keep and all that stuff, they really those types don't really don't need a pre-keep either. You're just, that, that that would be a matter of, you know, like I always say, my dogs were in pre-keep for them when they're born. So I pretty much knew what weight they were going to make. They knew how to work. I got all the kinks worked out. They're already cleaned up and ready to go. Their area is is clean and bug free, and you know, there's there's you know when you dog have dogs outside, there's a lot of things that could get to them. You know, depending on where you live, especially if you live out in the country, and even in town, you know, they could get a hold of something or they'll grab something. You know, uh, you know. In the country, they could be snakes and toads and spiders and black widows and brown recluse and all that. So you'd have to make sure that all that is taken care of, especially if you're moving them to a new spot. Which is why it's important, whatever keep area, if it's outside, you're going to put them in, have all that taken care of. They have proper housing, clean area, no parasites, no bugs, no snakes, no nothing like that. In town, you know, if they're not used to being inside in a garage, just that confinement, it can make them run the kennel. 
It can make them jump up or some of them become destructive and grab it and bite it. Chew on the cement, the blocks, if you have those, you know. They'll do all kinds of stuff because they're not accustomed to it. So that's why I say, you know, I taught my dogs from a very young age to go through a keep. It wasn't just the exercise part. It's the actual uh, where you're going to put them up, where you're going to contain them, where you're going to have them. If they're good inside the house, you know, uh, sleeping on the couch and like that, that, that's fine too. But they have to be used to that. You have to be careful when somebody comes in the house, they don't run out. You have to be careful the blinds ain't open or the curtains are drawn so they can't, eat outside, can't see outside. They might go after something they see on the street and jump through the window. It's happened. Dogs have killed themselves doing that because people live in an apartment building two or three stories high and they jump out the window chasing some dog they see on the street and they get killed or they cut the shit out of their self because they go through a, a window trying to get at something. So there's a lot of precautions and a lot of monitoring that need to be done. But if you have a dog that's very active, you have to decide whether you're going to do very little with them and basically bring them off the chain or you're going to put them through a keep and you're going to monitor how much rest they have, how much work you're doing. Uh, they have to be put up, you know. A lot of times if they're rambunctious and you have them in a kennel inside, it's best during their off time to just give them a bone to chew on. Now again, that bone is going to add weight. It's going to take away some moisture. You know, uh, it's going to, uh, you have to factor that in. So you have to take the bone away <clears throat> before the end of the keep. Whether it's a week or two weeks, some people do a month, you know, uh, if it's a long keep. But even a week, you know, now you have to adjust the, you have to adjust your feed. You have to adjust the water intake. Because they're going to chew on that bone. They're going to eat it too. It's extra calcium. It's good for their jaw. Builds their muscles. All that stuff. But it also affects the weight. The monitoring of the weight. So that's a little tip on, you know, if you have an excitable dog or a very active dog. You can, in my opinion, you do one of two things, you know. Very little or monitor them very closely. And they have to be put up so they won't be rambunctious on their time off and if they are that that type you may have to give them more rest you may give them three days a week rest because they're so active so and and part of the conditioning is their mental conditioning you know they have to have their mind right you can't have females around them that are in heat you can't have a lot of stuff Going by, you know, that's going to get them off their feet and get them active and get them barking and screaming at stuff. You know, uh, part of the keep, you know, if you uh, take it liter literally, you know, the keep of a castle is the, is that surrounding barrier that keeps everybody away. It could have come from that or it could come from, you know, you're keeping your dog in seclusion. Keeping him away from everything. So wherever the term comes from. Uh, you have to take into consideration. That you're going to monitor your dog. That you're going to keep him in a specific area. That you're going to. Give a lot of attention to this dog. That's where that bonding comes in. Keep outside influences that are negative. Away from him or her. You know. So there's a lot to it, but a lot of that is in their mind also. You want them keyed up to a certain extent during a workout, and you want them to get more keyed up leading up to the day of the show, the peaking part. Their mind has to be right. So... uh When it comes to breeding, you know, you're making these decisions on the type of animals you want. Those are part of the decisions. 
are these dogs good workers? Are they lazy? Are they uh, more of the type that are intelligent enough to know when it's time to work, work, and when it's not, rest? You know, I've mentioned a bunch of times I like kind of the wild type, the type intense and, you know, have an active mind, a lot of focus. But I don't want them acting crazy all the time. I don't want them acting crazy when they shouldn't be acting crazy. I don't want them, I don't want that behavior, let's say, around kids or because a car goes by. Or because they see a horse down the street. Or a butterfly goes over or a bird flies around. That, that's not when I want them intense and focused and wild and primal. I want them that way when they're working. I want them that way when they're faced up and when they're doing their thing. And again, I'm speaking of the past. Nothing meant for illegal purposes. But it's just the, the mentality of the dog... In certain situations, I wanted them a certain way. In other situations, I didn't want them that way. So you have to breed the type of dogs that understand that, that have that intelligence, where you have that understanding between you and the dog when it's time to turn on and when it's time not to. And even if you have those wild type, Bolio type or Jeep type that are like that, you can breed the type that ain't crazy all the time, that ain't wild all the time. I had a bunch of them like that. Mine were very active. Mine were 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 intense. But they weren't stupid. They didn't have a reason to be that way. Uh, they weren't. You know, it's one thing if you walk a dog by them while they're on the chain and they start screaming and hollering and all that. That's one thing. But they shouldn't do that when a bunch of kids are out there playing. They shouldn't do that because my dad drives up in a truck, you know. They shouldn't do that every time a bird flies over their, their uh, chain spot, you know. So that's part of the breeding process too. Everything you put into them, you're going to get out of them. And uh, that could be something good. It could be something bad. It could be something in between. You know. <clears throat> Everything you get out of them. You have to put it to some kind of use. There has to be a reason why. And if you're getting. Those types of individuals. Those are the ones you breed. Those are the ones you run with. Right. Right. Just like some dogs are good at traveling, some ain't. Most of mine were. I had one or two that wasn't. But uh, that was important to me. And I, I traveling, I don't care if it's a half hour away or five hours away. Or ten hours away or nine hours away or six hours away. It's just the fact that they could go through that process and didn't change their attitude. Didn't spook them. Didn't make them car sick. You know. It, it wasn't where they're looking outside and every time they see a dog on the street through the car window, they go crazy and all. Most of them just kind of kick back, waited till we got there. Once we got there, they knew what was up. But in between the time leaving and getting there, they weren't acting stupid. They weren't wasting their keep, wasting their conditioning, burning their peak. So all that comes with breeding too. And when you speak about improving dogs, you know, the the improvements are incremental and percentage-wise. Meaning, uh, you may increase, you know, you may want to increase the speed. They already have speed, you want them a little faster. It's going to be incremental, it's not going to be a great difference. Mouth, air, strength, things like that. But on a whole, those small increments mean a lot. In a single individual. And percentage wise. If you're getting more individuals like that. That's where you see the greatest improvement. In your family of dogs. If you make a breeding. Let's say you want to inbreed your dogs. And you inbreed them. And it works. Great. You have to figure out what you're going to do. After that. You may want to inbreed them again. If you inbreed them again. 
and it works great. And you may want to inbreed them again. If you do it a third time or fourth time, whatever it is, if it gets to a point where that didn't work, you stop right there. Call those individuals and go back one generation to the ones before. Take that inbreeding and cross it. Or loose line breed it. That's how you would eliminate a mistake or something that didn't work. Same thing if you breed a dog this way and it works. And you breed a dog that way and it doesn't work. You keep on breeding it this way. Not that way. Now that may take a breeding. That may take two breedings. I, would, I wouldn't I would venture to do it three times. If something's not working, it's not working. And because I didn't have a lot of dogs. I didn't keep a lot of dogs. If a breeding didn't work for me one time, I wouldn't continue that way. And it may be, when I say one time, it may be you make a breeding. You have to raise the dog and see what works. You may make two breedings that same way. Now you have two breedings that are similar going that way. One may work, the other doesn't. So you go with the one that works. You may not, the, both of them might not work. Both of them could work, but both of them might not work. If they don't, I would just eliminate that. Both of them. I wouldn't keep trying to make that work. Because I didn't have a lot of dogs to deal with. Where I could say, okay, I'll keep trying or I'll keep see something else. You know, It's kind of a hard way to go. But if you don't have a lot of dogs, the only ones that you should be keeping are the best ones. The best ones that represent what you're trying to do in your program. And the best ones that show you through performance are the ones you should keep. And then after that, the best ones that are able to produce. And you can do that with not a lot of individuals. It's just your culling process and your, your uh, selection. Culling process is harder and your selection is smaller. So it should be better. You should... Try and get used the best individuals rather than say, you know, well, I'm going to keep both brothers or I'm going to keep both sisters. I'm going to breed both of them and see how I go from there. When you breed both of each, you may only be in the position where because you have a small yard, I go with the best one, the best brother, the best sister, the best one that produces the best. Even though the other one might produce pretty good, one of them's going to produce better. And the way I found that out was to breed them, breed the males to the same female. Right? Two brothers, breed them to the same female, back to back. Two sisters, three sisters, breed them to the same male. Breed each sister to the same male and see which of those breedings are the best. This takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't tell from when they're puppies. You have to wait till they're mature. Or at least close to maturity, you know. By two years old, you know, I, my dogs, I knew which ones were going to make it, which ones weren't. And uh, if I happen to breed a female before the two year of age, it's because I considered them the best. But I didn't wait, other than my foundation dogs, I didn't wait till they were three or four or five years old to breed them. You're missing a lot of time and you're going to make those breedings anyways so if you're familiar with your dogs why not just use what you consider the best ones and make those breedings when they're two years old or two and a half or three or a year and a half uh, a lot of people would disagree a lot of people don't like to breed their dogs back in the day until their career was over and some people they were using a female for competition uh, if they bred her they wouldn't compete with her anymore because they thought in their mind anyways that that changed the makeup of the female now she's a mother the male you breed him now he's knows what breeding is like it's going to mess with his head maybe that's true and I'm not saying some dogs didn't react that way but in my mind, if a female I'm using for breeding and competing 
when she's being bred and she becomes a mother, that's the mentality I want her to have. That's the mindset I want her to have. Once she's whelped the pups and she's away from that, if I'm going to compete with her, that's the mindset I want her to have. Not the motherly mindset, the competitive mindset. And there's ways to get them to do that. You just go back, take her from that environment of being a mother and a caretaker and whelping pups to an environment of a competitor where she's around dogs that are <coughs> competitors as well. Where that exercise and that focus kicks in and that prey drive kicks in and that mentality of we're going to work because you're going to compete. That's the mindset she's going to have from that day forward. So, you know, I've spoken about mental conditioning. That's a lot of it is part of it. And a lot of it, you can influence the dog. Not subconsciously, maybe, or subconsciously, but unconsciously, you know, you're going through the motions that brings out these instincts in the dog. Whether the dog realizes it or not, it just goes along with the program. Uh, that played a big role in my dogs too. So when you see improvement in your dogs, uh, you run with that. And then you want to improve on that. <coughs> if you're starting with, say, uh, level one, level two dogs, there's no way to go but up. You know, uh, if you're starting with top flight dogs, they're only going to get so much better in terms of ability and all the traits we like, you know. But what you can do is get more of them that are on that level. Rather than having one or two, you got five or ten. That's how I see improvement. That's how I saw it in my own dogs, and that's how I saw it in other people that that bred and competed with their dogs. They always have good dogs. They improved all their abilities a little bit. They increased them a little bit. But besides that, they have a lot more dogs. And I started getting more dogs that were at a higher level rather than an average level. So in my mind, my average was uh, what other people would call above average. That's the way I looked at it. Someone's average to me was below average. My average was above average to a lot of the other dogs I saw. And there's other people that have done the same thing. You become familiar with the family of dogs. That's why people say that guy always has good dogs. He always brings good dogs. He breeds good dogs. It's because of that. That's how I see the improvement. So you got to ask yourself, you know, over time, have your dogs improved to some extent or not? That's where, you know, kennel blind, being kennel blind can mess you up. Or not accepting that you're making a mistake. Or you shouldn't keep this individual. Or you shouldn't breed that individual. You know. That's where it seemed to flip around. Where people are more interested in pedigrees. Than they are the individual. And when you're interested more in the individual. And you build off that individual. All the individuals. Hopefully. <clears throat> before them. And surely after that are top individuals. So then when you look at the pedigree in that respect, you're seeing top individuals across the board. And by doing that, you're going to increase your percentage of producing top individuals. That's just, nature does that. All other facets of, of Working and sporting domestic animals do that. That's how you become the best. Or considered one of the best. And your peers will let you know. 
and uh, because they recognize the difference between average, above average, good, and great, you know. So that's a little bit about conditioning and breeding, how they kind of intermingle. And as always, your comments are appreciated. And so is your support for all my merchandise and books and all that. Uh, so are your donations if you want to, you know, if you want a subject covered relatively quickly, make a donation and I'll cover that topic if I can. You know, you can reach out to me beforehand and ask me before you make a donation. If I can't cover a subject, I'll let you know and you don't have to give me money for no reason. <laughs> So, but, you know, that those always take precedence, you know, books still available, t-shirts, all that stuff. Contact me on my, uh, you know, email, uh, Facebook Messenger or Instagram. And again, thank you for your support and more vids on the way. Always, never ending till I'm not here. Thanks.